Hallelujah, hallelujah. Good evening, everyone. You're welcome to the service today. This is the King's Court service, Wednesday Bible teaching and prayer service. We're going to start off right away. Let us pray. Father, we give you praise. Thank you, Lord, for known unto you are all your ways from the beginning. And Lord, you call us to align with you. You call us to come into the inheritance that you've ordained for us. And we continue to press in. We're not taking no for an answer. And we refuse to stop midway. We want to go all the way in as far as your grace permits. As far as you want to take us into and as far as is made available to our generation. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Teacher, guide, helper. Come guide us into all truth. Glorify the Father. Glorify Jesus. And may we be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Again, you're welcome to the service today. Uh, we're going to continue from where we left off last week on the subject of taking on responsibility for kingdom advancement. Taking on responsibility for kingdom advancement, and this will be part two. Taking on responsibility for kingdom advancement, part two. Let's jump right in. <clears throat> All right. So, as a way of recap, the overarching theme of our discussion so far is that there is a sound from heaven that indicates we have come into a new phase in the advancement of God's kingdom agenda. We talked about it from the Habakkuk 2.14 template. Uh, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth just as the waters cover the sea. How the waters cover the sea, how the, the ocean covers the sea, billows, waves, billows, and waves. So they come in waves, and we are saying a new wave is crashing upon us. A new wave is coming to us. And uh, for those who are priority seekers, they not only hear the sound from heaven, but they're also announcing it. They're also indicating it. And it is our prayer that the rest of the house, the rest of the body, and the rest of God's people will plug in into it. So we've already established that the Lord Jesus, who is the king of the kingdom, came announcing the accessibility of the kingdom. His initial message was the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. To be at hand means it is within reach. To be at hand means it is accessible. And again, Matthew 4, 17, Mark 1, 15 show us that. So he came announcing that. But he also announced, even while he was in his early ministry, that access was granted for priority seekers. Uh, Matthew 6, seek first or make priority the seeking of the kingdom and all these other things will be added. So he declared that those who seek as a matter of priority, not only would they receive the kingdom, but other things will be added. So he also announced that access was granted for priority seekers to discover mysteries of the kingdom as well as take ownership, responsibility for the advancement of the kingdom on earth. Uh, we're told in Mark 4, 11, he said, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom. Think about that for a second. The Lord Jesus declared that to his audience, it had been given to know the mystery of the kingdom, his disciples, those who were following him. So not only was he saying the kingdom was accessible, he also declared that the, the mysteries of the kingdom you know, we're, we're available also for those who will pursue, uh, they can actually come into those dimensions. He made it clear that it was the Father's pleasure to give or commit the kingdom to priority seekers. Think about that. It was the Father's pleasure to do that. In other words, it pleased the Father for people to come and access the kingdom or to discover the mysteries of the kingdom. Uh, Luke 12, 32, it tells us it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He didn't just say for you to come into the kingdom or for you to press into the kingdom, but to give you, commit to you so that you become one who takes ownership responsibility for the same. So it is important to remember that these statements were made to regular people. You know, we have this issue in today's world where some people think there are some, you know, special class of people to whom the mysteries of the kingdom are made known or those who, who alone have access to this dimension of uh, revelatory knowledge of the kingdom of God. But let's remember these words I just quoted, Luke 12, 32, Mark 4, 11, Mark 1, 15, and so on and so forth, were spoken to regular people. 
they were spoken to the masses of people who came to listen to Jesus. Boys, girls, men, women, old, young, all manner of occupation, the learned, the non-learned, as long as they came to listen to Jesus, he made it plain to them that these truths of the kingdom were made accessible to them. So these were everyday people. And what does that say to us today? It tells us then that everyone and anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus as Savior, acknowledges him as Lord and King over a realm. Let me talk about that a little bit. You know, the Bible says, you know, if you should believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth his Lordship. So why is it necessary to declare that he is Lord? It, that is actually the Lord or the Father showing us that he is the Lord or King over a realm. There's a realm that he's Lord over. Because, of course, when you look at the natural world, it doesn't look like Jesus is Lord over this realm. It doesn't look like he's king over this realm. Uh, but he also declared, my kingdom is not of this world. Or my, my realm, my government, you know, the realm over which I am Lord is not this realm. But the believer who comes to accept Jesus, who comes to know the Lord Jesus, must acknowledge also that he's Lord over a realm. That realm we know as the kingdom of God. We're going to talk more about that. But any believer, anyone who accepts Jesus as Savior, acknowledges him as Lord, King over a realm. When you acknowledge him as Lord, you're also acknowledging that realm over which he is Lord. And then that individual decides. It's got to be a decision. We cannot leave this to, uh, you know, chances. It's got to be a decision. Decides to be a priority seeker. When Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God, see, that, that's, that's an instruction. That is... That is not an optional statement. It's, it's a, literally a command, if you will. So those who decide to obey that command and make the seeking of the kingdom a priority, they have access to the kingdom of God and can discover mysteries of that realm or of the kingdom. And they can also become responsible for those mysteries that it is, you know, will be revealed to them. So think about it. What does that mean? It means you and I. It means anyone, everyone, everyone who accepts Jesus Christ. To you, the invitation is given. To you, the call is made. Don't say, oh, it's only for fivefold ministers. Don't say it's only for apostles. Don't say it's only for those who have received some dramatic experience with God. Oh, you know, brimstone, hot coals falling on their head or some experience. Or, you know, seeing, a, a brim, I mean, a thundering and lightning. No, so how can it be for me? I just, I'm just a common, a simple believer. No, even you, the Lord Jesus would say to you that access has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Now, did the people of Jesus's day embrace this truth? That's a question to understand. Remember I said some time ago that the Lord God is willing to wait, you know, upon a generation to see if they can actually come into the truth that is ordained for it. You know, if a generation chooses not to come into the truth that God has ordained for it, the Father will just be waiting until individuals, a group of people, a company of people can come and say, Father, we receive this promise. We believe you. The Bible says we're not of them who draw back to perdition, but we're of those who believe to the saving of the soul. So belief to the saving of the soul. There are people who draw back. And draw back is not the will of God for us. There will be those who press in until we'll accomplish and attain all that God has ordained for us in our generation. Amen to that. Now, so Jesus told them, not only was the kingdom accessible, but also the mysteries of the kingdom were accessible to them. But instead of embracing this truth that Jesus brought to them about the kingdom of God and the mysteries thereof, many chose to oppose it. Some out of ignorance, some out of pride, some out of rebellion. And some even went as, as far as blaspheming the kingdom, blaspheming this truth and attacking it. And we talked about those last week, so I'm not going to go into that anymore, but we already know how God deals with that. Opposition will always come. But the reason I'm going back to that right now is to say to us right now, do not be those who oppose the will of God. Do not join forces or join the team or the company of those who are mockers. There are people the Bible calls mockers. Psalm 1, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. How is it that you as a child of God, you're seeking counsel from the ungodly? Or the counsel of the ungodly is what you lean onto. And we saw that so much in 2020. 
a lot of believers began to seek counsel, even from the ungodly. The words of the ungodly made more impact in the lives of those who are supposed to be, you know, truth seekers, those who are supposed to be leaning on the Holy Spirit. But it didn't stop there. It said those who stand in the way of sinners and those who sit in the seat of the scornful, the seat of mockers. Child of God, if you find the spirit of mockery around you, you better beware about that because something is wrong, something is going on. And God is not one who dwells in the midst of mockers. When God's people begin to ridicule the word of God, ridicule the people of God, ridicule the counsel of God, you know that is not the spirit of God in their midst. It's okay for things. I mean, the things of God are actually a mystery. So we're not going to understand everything, but it's best to be still and know, to behold your peace and to ask. And if God gives you revelation, you can bring to the rest of the body of Christ. But if you do not have revelation from God, how do you open your mouth and condemn or ridicule the things of God? That is not of God. And for those who have found themselves in that situation, I think we need to start repenting from that. Because even if the Lord was using you to bring correction, it's not going to be mockery. It's not going to be ridicule. It's not going to be using blasphemous words. It's going to be words, choice words, inspired by the Holy Spirit to bring correction and even correction in love. That's what the word of God tells us. But anyway, let's move forward. We talked about these already, you know, a lot of opposition. But let's be clear about something. About 2,000 years ago, when the Lord Jesus physically walked the earth, he announced the accessibility of the kingdom of God. What do we mean by that? A realm of God's influence and governance, a realm where the governance of God is felt, a realm where the influence of God is felt. Jesus announced that, and this was about 2,000 years ago. But we also know that he told his audiences that they were welcome to press into this realm. They were welcome to press into the realm of God's kingdom. They were welcome to press into this realm of God's governance. They were welcome to press into this realm of God's influence, the influence of the Father God. Now, observe, out of that realm of reality came a number of things. Number one, the assurance of salvation. But not only that, watch this, a force came out of that realm that Jesus spoke about that was able to drive out evil spirits. And not only drive out evil spirits, but make the infirmed well again. We call it healing. And what, what, what did that do? It attracted people. Because before Jesus came, I mean, people were bound. Nobody was sure of salvation. There was no deliverance. There was no healing. And here comes a man declaring that I'm coming from a realm. I'm bringing a realm to you that is able to bring salvation. And out of that realm or that realm of God's governance, which we call the kingdom of God, there is power that is able to drive out evil spirits. And not only that, but can make you whole again, can make you well again. And the Bible said men began to press into it, Luke 16, 16. Men began to press into it because it was better to be saved, better to be delivered, better to be healed than to not. And so out of the realm of God's kingdom, salvation came, deliverance came, healing came. And by the way, ministry today is built based on this fact. Pretty much every known ministry is built based on Jesus saves, Jesus heals, <laughs> Jesus delivers. And that is perfectly in order. But then, would you know, child of God, that even in the same vein, while Jesus declared that the kingdom of God had become accessible, the kingdom of God had come within reach, the kingdom of God was at hand, in the same vein, watch this, the same Lord Jesus equally announced that the same realm, the kingdom realm, holds mysteries that the same audience could come to know. He said, to you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. So here was the man who announced that the kingdom was accessible. And out of that realm of the kingdom, we saw salvation, we saw healing, we saw deliverance. So men ran to it. Men pressed into it because they wanted to be saved, because they wanted to be healed, because they wanted to be delivered. But yet the same messenger, the same king of the kingdom declared, not only that, saints of God, there are, or not only that, uh, follow my followers, those of you who are coming to hear me, there is also mysteries that you have been given to know. And not only that, he said that the father wanted them to do so. In fact, we already saw it, that it would be his pleasure for them to do so. Think about it, child of God. When God says, it will be my pleasure for you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. 
It will be my pleasure for you to know those things that are freely given to you by God. It will be my pleasure for you to explore this kingdom. It will be my pleasure for you to come and receive this kingdom. For it is my pleasure to give it to you. If it is the Father's pleasure to give the kingdom, it should be our pleasure to receive the kingdom. And it says it pleases him when we do that. But what do we have, saints of God? But before we talk about that, what are the lessons learned from all of that? Number one, the realm of God's kingdom is accessible to all. Remember, everyday people, regular folks. In fact, he had to rebuke the Pharisees for blocking the way. He had to rebuke the theologians and those who thought they knew he had to rebuke them for standing in the way and for not making it accessible to all. I think he will rebuke a lot of ministers in our world today who hoard knowledge, who try to show, you know, some kind of superiority based on revelation knowledge they have. But revelation knowledge is to be disseminated. Revelation knowledge is to be released to the house of God, to the people of God. So what are the lessons learned? The realm of God's kingdom is accessible to all, including you. Yes, you listening to me right now, no matter who you are. You don't have to have a theology, a degree in theology. You don't have to be a doctor of divinity. You don't have to be even called to ministry, if you will. All you have to do is know you accept the Lord Jesus as savior. You're a citizen of the kingdom. You make yourself a priority seeker and say, Father, reveal to me, you have the right and the privilege to receive the mysteries of the kingdom. What other lesson learned? The realm of God's kingdom is not limited to salvation, deliverance, and healing. We know that because we just mentioned, not only did Jesus say the kingdom is accessible or is at hand, he says the mysteries are also accessible. So the kingdom is accessible because men can press into it, Deliverance is there, healing is there, but the mysteries of the kingdom are also accessible. As a matter of fact, God wants to give the kingdom to us. So the realm of God's kingdom is not limited to salvation, deliverance, and healing. What next? The realm of God's kingdom holds mysteries. We talked about that. And citizens of the kingdom can access mysteries of the kingdom. You got to know that. And you got to believe that, child of God that the realm of God's kingdom holds mysteries that are accessible to you. Because if you never believe that truth, and I think that is part of the positioning to begin to enter into that realm, because what you don't know, you probably cannot possess. What you don't know, you probably cannot enter into. What you don't know, you probably cannot receive. But when you begin to know that the kingdom, the Father's pleasure is to give us the kingdom, and a part of our inheritance is to know the mysteries of the kingdom. And you begin to tell yourself, I can receive mysteries of the kingdom. It's not based on your calling. It's not based on whether you're an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. It's not based on whether you have a doctor in divinity or you have attended a theology school or whatever. No, just being a child of God, just being a citizen of the kingdom. You can access those mysteries of the kingdom. But what do we have today? A lot of ignorance a lot of ignorance of the mysteries of the kingdom. But may I say to us that ignorance is no excuse before God and ignorance is not of God. Just the very fact that ignorance is not of God, it should be enough reason for us to want to get away from ignorance. The Bible says for a man to not have knowledge, it is not good. For a man to be without knowledge, it is not good. Ignorance is not of God. And ignorance comes as a result of an attitude of ignoring things. What you ignore, you become ignorant of. What you ignore, you become ignorant of. But when you delve into it, when you begin to you know, study it, when you begin to go into it, begin to you know, ask questions about it, very soon you're going to find that you're not ignorant about it anymore. One of the damaging lies the devil has sold the church since inception, because it happened even in, in, the, apostles, in the disciples of Jesus Christ, that deception is that we do not need to go further than salvation, deliverance, and healing. Like I said, most ministries, if not all ministries, are built based on these three items, which come from the kingdom, salvation, deliverance, and healing. It usually ends with that. Some people want to see all the souls saved, and that's wonderful. Some people want to take it further to cast out devils. Some people want to see people heal and soul. My God, they lay hands, you know, to bring sick people to be healed. But don't forget... The same people who are being saved, who are being delivered and being healed, are also invited to come into the mysteries of the kingdom. So when a minister now takes the position to push this deception that people don't need to come further, or that people don't need to know the mysteries of the kingdom, what are they doing? They are actually glorifying ignorance. 
They are glorifying ignorance, but watch this, at the expense of the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why do you keep pushing ignorance when the spirit of wisdom and revelation has been poured out to the saints of God? Paul prayed, he said, my prayer for you, Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1, my prayer for you is that the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and revelation in the knowledge of Christ will be poured out to you, that you may know the hope of his calling, that you may come to know him even as you are known. The mysteries of the kingdom are made available, they are accessible, and they can only come by the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So when a minister begins to push ignorance and say, oh no, they don't need to know any more than that, or all they need to know is salvation, and you as a minister, you're not pushing into that, what are you doing? You're limiting yourself. You're not only limiting yourself, you're limiting those who come to hear you. And by the way, you're glorifying ignorance by doing that. They say things like, oh, that's too deep. We ain't going that deep. That's too deep. What do you mean that's too deep? What does that mean? Does that mean you can't comprehend it? Are you saying that God has not given you the ability to comprehend? Some will say, oh, the people will not understand. And, you know, I say this because when you travel a little bit, and when you, especially when you're called into the apostolic ministry, and the Lord gives you insight into his word, you're going to encounter these things. There are some places where you begin to talk about, the, you know, certain insights in the word of God, they shut you down. Like, no, no, that's too deep. We're not going that far. You know, just lay hands on the people, blow into the microphone, give them oil to drink, wave the mantle, cause them to roll on the floor and all of that. Child of God. That's not what God called you for. That's not all there is for you in the kingdom, to keep rolling on the floor, to keep drinking oil, to keep being waved mantles at to keep being laid hands on, to keep being blown into your face. And some have taken it to God, I mean, terrible places that I can't even begin to talk about right now. But remember, the one according to the kingdom also called you to come and know the mysteries of his kingdom. So when, when their minister said, no, that's too deep, or the people will not understand, who told you that? Who told you they won't understand? How do you know that? Do you limit the spirit of wisdom and revelation? Do you limit the power of the Holy Spirit? What did Jesus say? I will give you the Holy Spirit. He will guide you into all truth. Who says you can't take advantage of that? Why do you limit the Holy Spirit by saying the people can't understand? By the way, it's not you. It's by the Spirit. It's about the Holy Spirit. So when they do that, they settle around salvation, deliverance, and healing Watch this, earthly prosperity. And eventually the flesh regains strength and the mess continues. Because watch this, when you're not moving, you're stagnated. And when you're stagnated, very soon all manner of corruption begins to happen. But the, the revelation of the kingdom and the mysteries of the kingdom are intended to take us deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, higher and higher and higher and higher, stronger and stronger, you know, from one level of grace to another level of grace, from one level of glory to another level of glory. You just keep increasing. You just keep growing in the things of God. And I'm telling you, when we begin to plug in and plunge in into those depths of the knowledge of God, you won't have time for some mess. I'm telling you that. You won't have time for certain things. Because the revelation of the kingdom is so, is so intense that it will consume your entire life. You won't have time for stuff. But when you begin to see things like gossip, you know, things like backbiting, things like envy and jealousy and, and malice and hatred and, and, and people just circling around the flesh, it means that you've stagnated. Your growth is stagnated. But that's not God's plan for us. God wants us to get from one degree of light to a higher degree of light, from one degree of glory to another degree of glory. Paul actually dealt with a similar situation in Galatians 3, verse 1 to 5, and I want us to pay attention to this. In Galatians 3, verse 1 to 5, Paul began to speak to the Galatians, the saints at, 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 you know, in this particular place. He said, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? You before whom... Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Now, first and foremost, Paul did not take ignorance as an excuse. He didn't say, oh, these are Gentiles. They don't have the covenant of God. They don't know the, the things that God did through our prophets. You know, these are Gentiles. They will not understand. So let's just stay at salvation. Let's just stay at deliverance. Let's just stay at healing. Or let's stay at prosperity. Paul didn't do that. Paul kept on revealing revelation. In this particular place, what he was saying is, 
I actually set forth Christ to you in such a revelatory manner that it almost seemed like it was happening before your eyes. I made it so vivid. I made it so clear. I made it so crystal clear before you by the ability that the Holy Spirit had given to me to bring such revelation of Christ to you. So he said, why then did you not follow suit? Why then didn't you follow suit? Why are you going back to the things from which God have take, has taken you out from? The things God took you out from, you're going back to them. Verse 2, he said, this only I want to learn from you. In other words, tell me something. Explain something to me, O saints of Galatia. <clears throat> Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? So they were going back to the works of the law. We'll come to that. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He said, are you so foolish? So it's foolishness to be going backwards. Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Saints of God, we cannot be made perfect in the flesh or by the flesh. If you're seeking perfection or maturity in the things of God, you cannot find it hovering around the flesh or the dimension of the flesh or living the self-life, the flesh life. And oftentimes when people talk about prosperity, prosperity is wonderful. It is a promise of God unto us. I'm the Lord your God who gives you power to make wealth so that you can fulfill the part, your part of the covenant that we have signed. So my part is to give you the power to get wealth, but you have your own part of fulfilling the covenant. But oftentimes when people seek prosperity, it is for self-aggrandizement. It is for gratification of the flesh. It now leads to lasciviousness. It leads to covetousness. It leads to greed. And oftentimes you don't see them using that word to advance the kingdom of God, especially in spiritual matters. Paul says that you cannot be made perfect in the flesh. When your journey of faith began in the spirit, there is no way it's going to be perfected in the flesh. Verse 4, have you suffered so many things in vain? And even if it's indeed in vain, who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles amongst you? Did he do it by the workings of the law or by the hearing of faith? What is going on here? Paul, by the spirit, called this thing bewitchment. In other words, he was saying it's sorcery. In other words, he was saying it's satanic. Of course, you know, bewitchment is not of God. It is satanic. And that's why I called it a satanic deception. And if it is satanic, then we need to get away from it very, very fast. How do we know it's satanic? We know it's satanic because it prevented them from obeying the truth. He said, who has bewitched you, Galatians, that you should not obey the truth? So these things stopped them from obeying the truth. In their case, the truth that was revealed to them was that the law was and is incapable of transforming them. He also showed them that the supply of the Spirit did not come to them through their pursuit and observance of the law. So observe, these were people who had been observing the law since the days of Moses. And Paul was saying to them, you've been doing that. You've been in the law, observance of the law, pursuit of the law. But the moment I preached the message of faith to you and you received that message of faith, that's when the Spirit was supplied. That's why I was asking them, the spirit, the supply of the spirit did that come to you by the working of the law or by the hearing of faith. The miracles that have been wrought before you, did that come by the observance of the law or did that come by faith? So in other words, you're going back to the law is foolishness. You're going back to the law is a bewitchment. Why don't you stay with your journey of faith and keep it moving in that direction? Why going backwards? They receive the spirit through faith, not by the law. So if their embracing of faith caused the supply of the spirit, it was then foolish to return to something that could not cause the supply of the spirit in the first place. How does that apply to us? Think about it. What did you do to receive the realm of God's kingdom in the first place? <laughs> think, just think about it. What did you do to receive the realm of God's kingdom in the first place? The moment you came into the kingdom, what did you do to do that? What did you do to make that a reality? How did you get saved? How did you get delivered? How did you get healed for those who have received those? How did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you receive the Holy Spirit by shying away from the knowledge of it? No, of him? No. Did you receive the kingdom by saying, no, you know, it's too deep. That realm is too deep. I can't come into the kingdom. I can't be saved or God can't save me. You know, my sin, and some people actually say that, my sins are so terrible, so grievous that I don't think God can accept me. And that again is a deception of the enemy. So what am I saying, child of God? If God saved you and brought you into the kingdom and delivered you 
by the hearing of faith and healed you by you believing in the power of healing and as a matter of fact, filled you with the Holy Spirit, then there is nothing he cannot do for you. In fact, Romans talks about that, that he who loved us even while we were yet sinners, how will he now that you have become saved not give us all things freely? Stop saying it's too deep. So if we receive the supply of the Spirit through faith and didn't consider it too deep for us, I'm saying to us in the same vein, the same Holy Spirit is our guide into all truth about the same kingdom. Hallelujah to that. The same Holy Spirit you received is the same one who has come to lead us or guide us into all truth that pertains to the kingdom of God. The mysteries of God are packaged in the spirit. So let's stop saying it's too deep or we can't understand it. Or, I mean, what, what, when we say that what we're trying to do is, you know, we're trying to use uh, uh, earthly knowledge or earthly IQ, earthly understanding versus spiritual truth. But understand spiritual th truth comes by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher you can imagine or you can think of. And then he, he, they are spiritual truths. So spiritual truths have a way of permeating the people beyond, you know, human knowledge or worldly knowledge. Worldly knowledge can be confusing because, I mean, sometimes they are not even rooted in God. It's people just fabricating and, you know, coming up, concocting stuff and trying to push it down the throat of other people. But the Holy Spirit speaks truth and the spirit of truth will, 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 will uh, uh, sink with your spirit that is sanctified, redeemed, and is able to receive truth. So if you have received the Holy Spirit, then you already have the teacher. And not only do you have a teacher, you also have the mysteries of the kingdom contained in this teacher, the Holy Spirit. So all do you need to do? Simply make yourself available to learn. That's all. Simply make yourself available. Don't forget, it's a journey of faith. Your salvation, faith. Your deliverance, faith. Your healing, faith. The Holy Spirit, faith. Righteousness, by faith. So I'm saying to us, mysteries of the kingdom, by faith also. I remember years back, just giving myself as an example, I wasn't always like this. Many years ago, I didn't have, the, I, I didn't understand scriptures also. But I, I remember I used to pray, Lord, fill me with the spirit of wisdom and revelation knowledge. Grant, Lord, that when I teach, you know, when I preach your word, it will come with revelation. It will come with insight. And the hearers will also be impacted by the spirit of wisdom. I used to pray this and I prayed this for years. And then all of a sudden, insight began to come. As a matter of fact, for me, it began, it began in the book of Proverbs. I began to read Proverbs. We began to read, and I'm not saying it has to be the same with you, but that's how it happened for me. I began to read the book of Proverbs, and I began to see insight out of the book of Proverbs. And then we, we had King James mostly. So, you know, but then God was giving me greater insight. And then when other versions like New Living Translation and Amplified came up, I quickly latched onto them because I had already been open to that to those realms of exploring the word of God. Child of God, you have capacity for the mysteries of the kingdom. In fact, you were created for it. The spirit, when I talk about the soul the other time, is, again, is a, is a beautiful subject. The soul is, is, the, is the greatest study we probably can, can embark upon on planet Earth. Your soul has the capacity to, to drain in, to suck in, and to receive spiritual truth, spiritual knowledge. Stop limiting yourself because of your, you know, uh, natural abilities. Oh, I didn't go to school. Oh, I didn't bag a degree. Oh, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not a theologian. No, you don't need all that. Your spirit man can latch onto truth. I mean, it's like food. If you never eat, tasted a particular meal before, you don't know. Now you can be there and be saying, no, I can't eat this because I've never eaten it before. I've never had this before. I don't think it's going to digest well in my system. I don't think my body will absorb it. I don't think I will like it. I think it's going to kill me. It's too deep. It's too nice. It's too delicious. I can't have it. That's what we do with knowledge. But how do you not know when you now take it and taste it? Mm, wow, wait a minute. This tastes nice. <laughs> and then you pounce on it and you begin to eat it. And before you know it, you found a new favorite. You found a new favorite meal. It won't kill you. 
And watch this. Your body will not say, this is strange. I don't, I don't know what this is. We don't know how to digest it. No, your body is designed to digest it. I'm saying to you in the same way, your spirit man, your soul, they are designed to embrace truth that comes from the spirit of truth. So stop limiting yourself. Press in, child of God. Press in, minister of God. Don't just settle for salvation, healing, and deliverance. And every day, keep repeating the message of salvation. And praise God for salvation. But if every person in the church is saved, <laughs> oh my God, it's time to go to other things. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Move on to maturity as the Spirit gives grace and utterance. All right, let's quickly talk about practical steps in taking on responsibility for kingdom advancement. What are practical steps we can take in order to position ourselves to become responsible for kingdom advancement? Well, the first thing, again, is to indeed acknowledge the agenda of God. Because everything I'm saying is the agenda of God. That's the way he said it. That's the way the word of God ordained it. That's the way God wants it to go. So, when we, we, unfortunately, what, what a lot of people do is they come and set up their own religion. We now have what we call ministry. But sometimes we don't bother to check whether what we call ministry is actually in line with the, the will of God, with the agenda of God. Oftentimes we say it works. It works. And so because it works, we continue doing it. But we don't ask to say, God, is this how you want it done? Uh, Jesus, is that how you did it? Because it works doesn't necessarily mean it's of God. When Moses struck the rock the second time, water gushed out of that rock. It worked indeed. And the people drank and were satisfied. But Moses had trouble with God because God didn't ask him to strike that rock a second time. Think about a child of God. Think about a minister of God. We want to follow the pattern of Christ. And if Christ didn't bother revealing mysteries of the kingdom, giving parables, talking about heavenly things, then why are you as a minister shying away from pressing in to the knowledge of God, deeper dimensions of the mystery of God's kingdom? Don't you know that's how we overtake? Don't you know that's how we rule? Don't you know that's how we come into our place of kingship and authority? That's how we begin to understand the workings of the spirit. That's how we begin to understand that we rule and reign with Christ in the realm of the spirit. If we stay at the beggarly level, we remain beggarly in the things of, of the world as well. All right, let's just move on. Uh, so so uh, first, first is to acknowledge that the, this is the agenda of God. What is it? That Jesus is Lord or King over a realm. And that realm we call the kingdom of God, the domain of the king. The king being Jesus, his domain, his realm, his realm of influence, his realm of authority, his realm of governance. Acknowledge that. Acknowledge that. Then B, the kingdom of God is now accessible to me through Jesus Christ, not only for apostles, not only for ministry gifts, not only for those who have attended Bible school, not only for those who have some kind of degree in whatever, whatever. No, it's accessible to you. Jesus preached to ordinary people, everyday people, and he told them the kingdom of God is now at hand. It is within reach. It is accessible. You've got to believe that, child of God. The kingdom of God is accessible to me. Begin to make it your claim. Stick your claim there. Don't, don't believe anything else that Jesus didn't say. Believe what Jesus said. The kingdom of God is accessible to me. And then after that, move to the next level, that the accessibility of the kingdom gives me the right to seek out mysteries of the kingdom. So the fact that you have the access uh, authentication into the kingdom gives you a right not just to become a, a mere kingdom citizen who just enjoys the benefits of the kingdom. Oh, when I'm sick, I run to Jesus. Oh, when demons do who? I run to Jesus. Oh, when I, I need money, I run to Jesus. We only pray when there's a need. But you now begin to know that there are mysteries in the kingdom that I'm supposed to be discovering. What are those mysteries? You begin to ask those questions. What are those mysteries? Holy Spirit, teach me mysteries of the kingdom. Open my eyes to the reality of the mysteries of the kingdom. And then the next thing, make it priority. Now, this one is a big one, even though it sounds easy. Make kingdom advancement your priority. First within before without. Because when I say kingdom advancement, the initial thought will be oh, to go out, to preach, travel all over the world. That's not the first thing. The first thing is to, for the kingdom to come within. The kingdom to be established within. 
the Bible says, I think in Mark chapter 9, or chapter 3, verse 9 or so, that they, they were with Jesus. He called them to be with him, and then he could send them. So the order is to be with Jesus first. And then he can send if he chooses to send, because some he actually doesn't send. I mean, I, I can tell you that, but let's not go into that. So the, but the first order of business is to come. The call of God is for you to answer, to come to Jesus. So your, your first order of business in kingdom advancement is to make sure the kingdom is within you. Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God is amongst you. But then he wants to come within you. So pursue the kingdom with priority to make it your reality, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom. Make it your such priority. Make it something you search with zeal, with zest. Make it a priority. A lot of people, it's not priority. And because it's not priority, they put the kingdom, the kingdom becomes an optional thing to them when we get to it. In fact, some churches, think about it, some, think about it, ministers, some churches never talk about the kingdom for a whole year for years. How is that possible, actually? I don't even know how that's possible. If you look at the book of Matthew, again, every other chapter, every other chapter is a mention of the kingdom. Every other chapter is a mention of the kingdom. Jesus' message, repent for the kingdom. You know, he's the king of the kingdom. Everything about his message, kingdom, 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 kingdom. And then we are preaching now, we're not even talking about the kingdom. So when you talk about kingdom, for a lot of people, is a, is a removed reality. It's a distant concept. It's like, what are you talking about? You've got to make this your priority, child of God. You've got to make it your priority, minister of God. And listen, for those who might have some arguments with that or debate, making the kingdom your priority doesn't change the message God has given to you. As a matter of fact, it ties it in together. The message of the kingdom of God is what ties in all the other message together. I'm going to show us a little bit of that. When you begin to understand the perspective of the kingdom, everything begins to fall in place. 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 So make it your priority. Now, kingdom advancement ought to be a priority for every citizen of the kingdom. Again, this is not only for fivefold ministry. This is not only for apostles. This is not only for Bible school graduates. No. For every, if you're a citizen of the kingdom, then I'm saying to us today by the word of the Lord, kingdom advancement ought to be your priority. And don't forget again, kingdom advancement begins first within. Seek Jesus. Seek to know him. Seek to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit who now brings us into the knowledge or the mysteries of the kingdom. Now, somebody might ask why. Why is it that every citizen of the kingdom must make the kingdom of God or kingdom advancement a priority? Well, number one, it is why we were created. Revelation 4, 11, thou art worthy, O Lord. I chose King James because of the word he used there. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. Watch that. If he's created all things, that includes you. That includes me. But why? For his pleasure. You were created for his pleasure. You were created for by him and for him. So those of us who are talking about, you know, I'm living my best life, I want to live my life. You, you were not created to live your life. You were created to live his life. And I know that's a removed reality for those who are not members of the kingdom of God or members of the body of Christ. But for those of us who are members of the body of Christ, we must begin to align truth to truth. Building blocks of the kingdom, construct of the kingdom. We're not to live for ourselves. We were created for his pleasure to please him so the question is what pleases him what pleases him matthew 6 10 thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven so what pleases him his will pleases him what is his will for his kingdom to be manifested on the earth and so you become a citizen of his kingdom so you must make that a priority number two it is the plan from the beginning. It's been the plan, Revelation 5, 9 to 10. You are worthy to take the scroll. And don't forget, this is removed from planet Earth. I'm not going to go into details. You're worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So those who are trying to seclude or cut off some people, you are in the wrong. This is from every tribe. This is from every tongue. 
those who are trying to be ra racist about it. There's no room for that. God created all men. The Bible said, from one blood, he has made all mankind. From one blood. Our humanity and the unity of our humanity doesn't come from skin color. It comes from our blood. The blood level, the DNA level is where we're united. We're not united at skin level. At skin level, we're going to find differences. And those who base on skin level will always find disunity. But when you base on DNA and base on blood, then you know we are all the offspring of God out of every tribe. And so you child of God who is leaning towards racism in any way, whether racism against black or racism against white or racism against Asians or brown, you are in the wrong. God doesn't look at skin color because he's redeemed us out of every tribe and every tongue and every people and every nation. But look at verse 10, he's made us kings and priests. So you say, God, when you stand before him in heaven, Lord, what do you have for me? I want to make you king. <laughs> Where do you find kings? In kingdoms. So it's the plan, child of God. That is why the kingdom of God must be priority. But look at the next line, and we shall reign on the earth. How can you reign as a king on the earth when you don't know what kingdom is about? How can you reign on the earth when you don't understand what rulership is? Reigning is a matter of kings. Reigning is a thing for kings. So if he's made us kings, and priest unto him, then begin to enter into the reality of his kingdom. A part of this ability to reign that he's called us to do is found in the mysteries that he reveals. The mysteries will show us how to reign. But let's move on. The third thing, it was the original intent for creation, and it is also how the story ends. So if you have another plan, another vision, another expected end, expected future, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you may be disappointed because the end that God has ordained, the end that God has apportioned, the end that God has written is about the kingdom. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3 to 6, look at that. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, uh, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Watch that. The tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse four, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. But look at verse five. Then he who sat on the throne. So in the end, you're going to see one sitting on the throne. And where do you find thrones? In kingdoms. So the setting of God is a kingdom. The reality of God is a kingdom. The agenda of God is a kingdom. It's in kingdom you talk about kings. It's in kingdom you talk about thrones. Then he who sat on the throne said, watch this, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. Look at verse six. And he said to me, it is done. What is done? What we decided to do from the beginning. It is done. We've accomplished it. We've done it. So all the stuff going on right now, ups and downs, controversies, contentions, sometimes looks like the kingdom is failing. Sometimes looks like the devil has the upper hand. Sometimes looks like humans are having the upper hand. All of that is part of the story. But in the end, what we're going to hear is it is done. What is done? What God ordained from the beginning. And what is that? That we will come into the fullness of his kingdom reality, which is why now you have to make his kingdom your priority. Now, the next thing, E, begin to approach your journey of faith and worship of God from a kingdom perspective. A lot of people still see their journey of faith and worship of God from a church mentality. And we've talked about this a lot of times. Church is going to end eventually. Church has an end. I mean, just write it down. Uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Uh, not Matthew, Matthew 17, verse eight, uh, 18 and 19. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail. But when you get to Revelation 21, 16, I believe, or is it 22, 16, it said Jesus signified to the churches. So it's, it's no longer my church, it's become the churches. 
But the church is to prepare us for the kingdom. The church is to, one of the things the church is to do, I mean, the church is for fellowship, the church is for equipping, the church is for activation of the gifts, the church is for exposure, the church is for giving opportunity to minister and developing your ministry gifts, but the church is, all, and the church is also for, you know, a community outreach and all of that, but the church is also a place where we come to learn the kingdom. So churches are doing all the other stuff. A lot of people are so involved in community outreach, praise God for that. Not so many are involved in equipping the saints, but some are bringing them up to the point where they become mature so that they, they too can minister according to the grace of God upon their lives. And the minister or the, 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 the senior leader is not in any way intimidated or insecure because you have your place, they have their place. Some people will shut down anybody who's trying to rise up. That's not the way. It's a place for fellowship, and a lot of people do that. You high five, hug one another, visit one another, have parties, breakfast thing, prayer meetings that end up becoming food meetings, and so on and so forth. But don't forget one more thing the church is supposed to do is to introduce us to the kingdom. How do I know that? I will give you keys of the kingdom. I will build my church, but I will give you keys of the kingdom. Where is it giving it? The church. I will build my church and I will give to that church the keys of the kingdom. So the reason for the church is to receive keys of the kingdom. So if you as a church, you never talk about the kingdom, you don't know what the keys of the kingdom are, you don't understand the dynamics of the kingdom, you don't understand the elements of the kingdom, you don't understand the citizens of the kingdom, you don't understand the power, the domain, the glory of the kingdom, or to talk about the king of the kingdom, that's a big problem right there. So I'm saying to us, let our mentality and our perception of our worship of God, our perception of our spiritual journey of faith become that of a kingdom. Begin to see it as a kingdom. You are a citizen of a kingdom. Jesus is the king of the kingdom. And then you have other citizens of the kingdom. You have elements in the kingdom. And those are part of the mysteries he has called us to understand. We're going to talk about some of those in the days to come. Parable of the marriage supper says a lot. I'm not going to read it all because of time's sake, but I just want to pick a few verses. Verse 1, look at that. Matthew 22, verse 1 to 14. Verse 1, it says, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, verse 2, The kingdom of heaven is like. So this parable is showing us what the kingdom of heaven is like. What is it like? It's like a certain king. Child of God, is good to understand the analogies that Jesus used because we're creating our own ministry and going away from what Jesus ordained. Jesus told us that the kingdom of heaven is a kingdom indeed. And the parables show it. We're talking about a king here who arranged the marriage supper for his son. And, you know, I can go on and on. on. A lot of things happen here. Uh, for instance, you know, those who were invited rebelled, and we know those, you know, the first people were called to the kingdom, but he said, go into the uh, highways and the byways, and anybody you find, just bring them in, and so on and so forth, and so some people dwell on that, anybody can come in, anybody can come in, you know, and then he says the meal is prepared, the supper is ready, some people dwell on that, talk about the meals in the kingdom, everybody talks about the goodness of the kingdom, oh, God will bless you, God will polish you, God will, God will make your shoe shine, <laughs> God will give you a new car, you will have a private jet. All those are goodies of the kingdom. But don't forget, it's a kingdom. It's a kingdom and there's a king. And this king has an agenda. So if you just come and benefit from the kingdom, you eat the meal of the kingdom, the dainties of the king. You dress in the robes of the kingdom. You have all the goodies of the kingdom, but you never know why the king called you into a supper in the first place. Uh, that's a problem. That's what happened to this guy. Verse 11, but when the king, so you see the king, when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment. He thought it was only to come and eat. He didn't know there was a reason why he was called. He didn't understand that this is a kingdom and there's a corporate, you know, attitude. There's a dress code. That there's a way to behave in the kingdom. You don't just come. I know you're a preacher. Maybe the preacher who preached to this guy told him, come as you are. And then tell him, come for transformation. <laughs> That's the problem. They told him, oh, you're born this way. You don't need to do anything. That's why he didn't bother asking about the garment. They didn't tell him, you're going to be transformed. They didn't tell him, I know we picked you from the highways and the byways, but we're coming to the home of a king here. And I wanted to know there's a dress code. And I wanted to know why you were invited. 
You're going to be amongst other dignitaries. So learn the attitude of the kingdom. Learn the manner of the kingdom. Learn the speech of the kingdom. I was saying, I don't care. I will just come anyhow. Jesus is love. God is gracious. He will forgive. Oh, yes, he will. But you better make sure you're doing it within the time allotted because there comes a time when mercy is switched and becomes something else. This guy didn't bother about getting the wedding garments. Now, ask yourself the question, child of God, is it that they ran out of wedding garments? No. Think about it. The king who invited these folks to his supper, you don't think he has enough garment for everybody? He knows how big the hall is. He knows how many invitees he invited. He knows, in fact, when they brought the, in another portion of the Bible, when they brought this first set, he said, there's still room, go and bring more. He said, there's room, go, I need to fill this room. I need to fill this hall, go and bring more. Anywhere you find them, bring them. So it was not because there was not a garment for the guy. It was because either the people who brought him didn't tell him he needed to change or he was a rebellious person and didn't bother about changing. What was the king? King's word to him. My friend, the king even has good words. <laughs> He's not fighting with you. How did you come in here without a wedding garment? See, the king said, how? How did you do it? Did you come through the window? How, how, did you, how did you sneak in? So those who are in the church, but don't want, the, the Bible said they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of it. The power of transformation. When the power is coming, you dodge. When the word of God is coming in your direction, you dodge. When the minister talks about you, you criticize. And when the church is beginning to close in on you, you leave the church and you go somewhere else where they don't know you. And you hide in the crowd. Remember, the king sees all of that. Now is the time to correct all that. It's a kingdom. Begin to have the perception. It's a kingdom. Begin to have that concept. It's a kingdom. And there's a king. And there's order in the kingdom of God. You should begin to ask the Lord, where's my garment if you don't have one? What is the dress code in the kingdom? And how do you know these things? From the mysteries of the kingdom. And we're going to stop there for time's sake. You know these things from the mysteries of the kingdom. Oh, Father, we give you praise. Thank you, Lord. 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 Oh, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come in our lives. May your kingdom mysteries be revealed to us. May your will be done in our lives. And we now know it is your will and your desire and your pleasure for us to receive the kingdom. It is your will and your pleasure and your desire for us to come into the mysteries of the kingdom. So we come to you on today. For many, Lord, the kingdom terminated as salvation, deliverance, healing, and then an endless pursuit of earthly prosperity, never-ending pursuit, never-ending pursuit. When they get thousands, then they're looking for tens of thousands. When they get tens of thousands, then they want to get hundreds of thousands. When they get hundreds, then they want to go to a million. When they get million, then they want to get a billion. But the question is, what are we doing with all that wealth? How are we advancing the kingdom with all that wealth? Getting the wealth is not the problem. What you do with it is the issue. But Lord, we know it's your desire to give us all that pertains to life and godliness. You are the God of prosperity, no doubt. You are the God who wants to prosper your, your children. The prosperity of your saints delight you. But then you said our prosperity is attached to our soul's prosperity. As our soul prospers, we also prosper. Many prosper in natural things, in material wealth, but their souls never prosper. No soul can prosper outside of you. No soul can prosper that doesn't get enriched and fattened in your presence. No soul prospers that shies away from your reality. No soul prospers that refuses to advance with you. So that we come to you for our soul's prosperity. We come to you, Lord, to reveal mysteries of the kingdom. We repent, Lord, for shying away from mysteries of your kingdom. Those of us who have been shying away, oh, we love when it's about salvation. We love it when it's about healing. We love it when it's about deliverance. Call for a deliverance ministry, my God, or deliverance service, the whole place is filled up. Call for a teaching service, only half of the people show up. Call for a prayer meeting, one quarter shows up. Just a quarter shows up. We repent, oh God. That's foolishness, child of God. If you've been doing that, you need to stop that. 
You need to, perhaps the reason you're running for deliverance is because you've not bothered to build up yourself in the Lord. You've not bothered to build up yourself in your most holy faith. You've not bothered to pursue the mysteries of the kingdom. Perhaps one of the mysteries of the kingdom that God might show you is your authority over demonic spirits. Think about it. We shy away from the mysteries of the kingdom, but yet we have all manner of issues happening in our lives. Lord, we repent. We're sorry, O oh God. We no longer shy away. At least those under the sound of my voice right now, we repent for that. And everywhere this we go, we repent on behalf of your church. We repent on behalf of the body. We repent upon, on behalf of the church universal. For those who have shied away, ministers who have said, oh, it's too deep. Oh, don't tell them. They will not understand. How dare you say that about God's people? Are you saying the Holy Spirit can't teach them? Are you saying the Spirit of Christ in them cannot understand? We repent, oh God, for saying that. May we begin to press in. You said it is given to us to know these mysteries. So we repent for not making them our priority. You have given us the Holy Spirit, the teacher, and the guide. And we now declare that we are able to receive revelation knowledge through the Holy Spirit. We declare in your presence, oh God. We proclaim in your presence. We confess in your presence. And we say, oh Father, we are able to receive revelation knowledge through the Holy Spirit. And so we pray, precious Holy Spirit, reveal those mysteries to us. Reveal to us the mysteries of the kingdom. Reveal the mysteries of the kingdom to us. We are expectant and we position ourselves to receive. For we know, Lord, you are able to do it. We refuse to remain malnourished. For when we don't receive that which comes from you, we become malnourished. But we press in for divine orchestrations. We press in, Lord, talking about the brilliance of the kingdom, talking about the light of the kingdom, talking about the gemstones, talking about the, 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 the four living creatures, talking about the throne itself, the scepter, talking about the crystal sea. Oh my God, so much to discover. So much to discover that you want to enrich our souls with. We repent, oh God. And we begin to press in for these orchestrations. We press in for the light of your revelation. Let the light of your revelation shine on us for our generation. Our generation, Lord, is dying. Our generation is, is, is going through turbulent times. But Lord, you've given to us all that pertains to life and godliness. And you said the earnest expectation of creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. For to us it has been given to liberate and to bring deliverance to our world, to bring deliverance to creation. And here are sons of God shine away from their responsibility. We repent, Father. Let your light of revelation shine on us for our generation. For thine, O Lord, is the kingdom. Thine is the power. And thine is the glory forever and ever. Amen. And Lord, I begin to pray for those who are sick. By the stripes of Jesus, you have been healed. We declare healing over your body from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. <clears throat> And even those who are struggling, Lord, with demonic spirits, struggling, Lord, with demonic attacks, struggling with intimidation of demonic spirits, we declare, let the light of God shine. Let the light of God shine into your living conditions. Let the light of God shine in your living rooms. Let the light of God shine upon your bed. Let the light of God shine upon your life. Let the light of God bring illumination to expose the darkness. May the light of God shine upon your heart, shine upon your soul, and expose that hidden thing. Expose that locking spirit that is hiding. May they not be able to hide anymore. We declare, Lord, that by your power, by the stripes of Jesus, and by your shed blood, and by the power of your name, that deliverance comes to them right now. For freedom, Christ has made you free. We refuse that you are bound any further. Be thou made whole. Be thou set free. Walk into the glorious liberty of the sons of God, for it is your inheritance. It is your inheritance, child of God. Shake off the dust, shake off the shackles, and walk into freedom by the power of God. Lord, even the angels you've assigned to them will declare that they are equipped to battle every demonic force. They are equipped to, 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 to wage war and to overcome, for the word of God says they excel in strength. All you angels who hack into the voice of the Lord, who excel in strength, and do his bidding, find strength to overcome every mountain that your sons, the sons and daughters of God are facing so that they'll be able to scale every mountain and come out on the other side victorious. And for that, we give you praise, Lord. We give you honor. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen.
Amen. Praise the Lord. 